So without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker for today, um, Dr. An Anjali Malhotra. Um, Dr. Malhotra is a primary care physician with extensive training and expertise in women's health after creating and completing a fellowship focusing on contraception, gynae oncology, and general gynecology. Uh, currently, she is a clinical associate professor at UBC, as well as the Women's Health Medical Director at the First Nations Health Authority. So I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Malhotra. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. So thank you for having me. Um, I am Dr. Mahotra, the Women's Health Medical Director at Heading Today. I am calling in from the West Bank First Nation on Silk's territory and happy to have power and food available this week, which was certainly a struggle this week for, for most of my region. Um, I'm a proud adopted member of the Takaya Wolf Clan. So today we're here to really talk about our collective journeys and be on a journey together. Um, I'm really hoping that this is a safe space for us to share. We're not a humongous group, so it is possible for us to share. And, and I'm hoping that we can exchange some words throughout the course of this topic. Um, we're gonna be talking about cultural humility and cultural safety, explore what allyship means, and do some reflection. And that's where I'm hoping that uh, we can hear some voices. So a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Um, this is my hometown. Um, you'll notice here, and sort of why I'm bringing this up is you'll see the field there beside the barracks and uh, there's some homes there. One of those homes, my home right on the edge of the field. Um, the barracks are one of the last residential schools in Canada to close. It was in 1996 that this school closed. Um, and had been converted to a day school. Um, so me, not quite at midlife, um, went to public school with the folks that were in this residential school. So I think it's important for us to know the timeline on certain things that have occurred. So I just wanted to bring that forward. So now in British Columbia, I serve the First Nations people of British Columbia. I work in the office of the Chief Medical Officer, and our role is one of really looking out at where we work and the system in which we are in and seeing where we can make system change, where we can affect change in a positive way for our communities. Like everyone in healthcare, we want to ensure at FMJ that our community is at the center of everything because we see very clearly the impacts of all of the possible touch points in someone's life and what those are like on someone's wellness journey and their journey to being well. Um, we look at social determinants, family community, culture and ceremony, the grouping of traditional and Western medicine, land and spirit, and the impact that all of that has on someone's wellness journey as, as really important pieces in someone's wellness journey. And it's Although our system isn't necessarily designed to acknowledge this, it is our role to bring that forward in how someone's receiving care. When we talk specifically about the healthcare system that we work within, it's important to remember that every touch point that the patient has within the healthcare system is going to change the trajectory of their care in one way or another. That includes us, of course, those that are doing their surgeries, taking their blood pressures, bringing them into the hospital, also the people answering the phone, the people in the room in any way, shape or form, the people taking their blood, the person that's triaging them, but also something that's not always brought to light, the physical space that someone is encountering. When they walk into a room, particularly in this circumstance, is it reminiscent of an Indian hospital? Is it reminiscent of a residential school room? Is it welcoming? Does it have anything in it that states it's welcoming? Also the forms that someone fills out, the forms that they receive, are these potentially re-traumatizing or do they offer solace? Because it is possible. So we'll get into that. So what does being an ally mean? Where do we start? It's you know, a large, large place to start. Well, being an ally starts with cultural humility. There is no course, there is no lecture that can make someone culturally competent. We're all on a journey, a shared journey. The journey of cultural humility is reflecting upon our own biases and the biases within the system in which we work and live. The goal is cultural safety. 
a system that is safe, one without racism and discrimination, offering equity and equitable service. That's our journey that we collectively are on, wherever we might be on it is okay. But what we don't want to hear is that just doesn't happen in my hospital. That just doesn't happen in my clinic. There's, there's nothing that could be changed here because that closes cultural humility. And we cannot be in defense of the system in which we work. I'll tell you, our system was built on racism. We acknowledge it's FNHA, and I think everyone can now acknowledge us with more and more information being available. It's important to know that Indian hospitals only closed in the late 1980s. They're all through Canada. You will hear more about them as more and more is uncovered about where bodies lie and all of the other traumas. But at these hospitals, there was rampant physical and sexual abuse neglect and medical experimentation. That's a really important piece. The Sexual Sterilization Act in British Columbia was only revoked in 1973. That's just not that long ago. And it rears its ugly head through a course sterilization to this day. You can look at Joy Sachikwan's case of course terminations. It's important for us to know that this is current that these are the concerns that folks have with good reason. Residential schools, 60 scoop, and today's 60 scoop, which is foster care. It's important when you're an ally to know that we can make all of these big plans and strategies, and that's wonderful. And they, they obviously need to be in place, but knowing that that's not action or reconciliation, that is planning. It's important for our allies to know that there are stages of allyship. So showing up, absolutely, the key. Having an awareness of what has happened is the first step, unquestionably, and then the movement forward of challenging and changing. But when we're hearing the information as an ally, what we need to know is that we need to believe the information. The information has been presented to us and we have an abundance of it that I'll get into in a moment. But we cannot expect further explanation further investigation of the truths that have been told to us already time and time again. The information is here. It's the job of the ally to learn the information, to hear the information and believe the information. Because all of us want to move forward in a good way. We want to provide care in a way in which it can be received. We want to ensure that we are measuring the quality of our system and the care that we're offering well past our medical skill. We're all great clinicians. It's more than that. It's that circle of care. Because what's happening and has happened over the course of a very long time has been that folks leave community to access care in a way that they think might be safer. Or more commonly, don't access care. And that's what we see a lot of when it comes to um, gynecological care, where they receive care that they're re-traumatized by and that they don't feel comfortable with. And that's how our system was built. So what we wanna do is engage in system change. And we need to ensure that we're not asking the victims to do that. We're not asking the people who have been on the receiving end of the issue to continue to move the needle. That is the allyship role to take that on. One piece of that is embedding diversity and equity into everything that we do. Now, at times it can be very uncomfortable to do this because we've worked in a system that we were trained in, we've learned in, that exists surrounding us and in many ways, you know, seems functional. So it can be uncomfortable. You also as an ally run into challenges that can sometimes be very, very hard. But it's remembering that even small change matters. Even if it's the entire process isn't challenged and changed, every little bit matters. One step forward was the apology by all of the healthcare governing bodies to say concrete change is needed. That this has to be continually moving forward in our work and in our bodies. The draft practice standard telling us clearly we need to listen without requiring more explanation, hear things as truth, and consider how in each of our workspaces we can make that change. 
So when we talk about knowing the historical context and knowing what has gone on and continues to, it is vital that things like in plain sight are read, listening to residential school survivor stories. You can hear the videos, you can watch the videos, reading the missing and murdered women pieces that have been put out. And this year, our office, in combination with the PHO, put out Sacred and Strong. This is the First Nations Women's Health Report, a vital piece of reading to understand the current context of what we are dealing with. And in this, there are stories bravely told by so, so many throughout our province that I think are vital to our movement forward. Now, we want to hear the stories, and we want to believe them, and we want to hold those in a sacred way. But then as an ally, we need to take whatever talents and gifts we have to move forward. We can't just sit here listening and collecting information and wanting more information and hearing more. We need to move forward. And the thing is, is we are all very privileged. We all have an opportunity in our healthcare system to do something. It doesn't have to be to revamp the entire system by one person. We, I recognize that that's not a possibility. But what is a possibility are small things. And we'll go through that as we go through this talk. Because it's about saying the way that things have always been done is not working for a lot of people who need it the most. We need to ensure that the people that need it the most are being served. And so when we start challenging, that leads to change. Now, one of the things that came out this past year as well was the PSB, the Cultural Safety Resource. And I think it's also a vital piece of reading. It's on the PSBC website and it was written by an Indigenous author, Lucy Barney. And this is a bit of a toolkit to walk through cultural safety and reproductive health. And I think it's really important, but I wanna point out some pieces in it. One is ensuring in all of our practices that we respect Indigenous ways of knowledge that we ensure services are relevant to whom they are being targeted for, that there is reciprocity and responsibility on all parts of the work that's being done. Now, why I have relevant in, in uh, caps there is because when we talk about research, a tendency over time has been to collect, to extract, to ensure that we have more and more information on a topic. But unless that information is going to directly impact First Nations communities, it is time to change our ways. It is time to say, can this actually make meaningful change on the ground? Not just prove more of the points that have been made already, which it's great work, but we're not at that point now. We're at the point now of saying, how will this change something to go forward? Speaking about HPV specifically in cervical cancer in specific terms, um, we know that First Nations women are disproportionately impacted by cervical disease and are less likely to take part in screen. We know this, so that's been acknowledged. So now it's, you know, what do we do? Well, we sat and listened to current stories at FNHA, we, we hear it fairly frequently. Um, and residential school survivors were very clear with us that, you know, due to their abuses, they're not going to attend services. And a vital piece to this was that they're not going to go to colposcopy because the fear of coerced sterilization is an ongoing palpable fear in communities. And then, of course, the geographical logistics. So when we took on any work in cancer care at FNHA, we did a few things. One was, of course, we reflected on everything that has occurred and been told to us in this ongoing conversation. We ensured that whenever we were going into a community, we were very knowledgeable about cultural practices. I can't tell you every cultural practice within British Columbia for Indigenous communities because they're so different between community. I live in West Bank. And projects I did were in a sort of an hour radius of one health center, and each community that I visited were different. There are some overarching themes, but it's important to know that there's going to be pieces that you have to just ask. Open-ended questions of how can I serve, by how can I 
offer you care in a way that is in line with your cultural practices? What does that look like? We also ensured everything was individualized to ensure that it's relevant to community and that there was recipro reciprocity between us. One perfect example is the, administrative, the administration of self-screening swabs at one of our communities for HPV, knowing full well how well these swabs work and that more than likely someone who doesn't want a pelvic exam will likely want to have this instead. We were very aware of that outcome. So the outcomes that I looked at in something like this were not what we were looking at, but how we were looking at it. So when we went into community, the first thing we did was connect, you know, for who, who we could. And so someone at the health center was able to you know, enable this conversation. We sat down over the course of months over traditional foods. We ate, we learned, we heard, we told stories that had nothing to do with the disease of any kind. We told stories about community, our common grounds. I'm Indian, so there were some common grounds between eating and talking and all of the rest. We attended community events upon invitation, once invited, and just got to know people. We also ensured that we knew certain pieces, like the importance of the matriarchs in the community and the importance of oral traditions, because we could embed that into any work that we were doing to make sure that we always asked the matriarchs first. We always made sure there was space for oral traditions in any work that we were doing. We made sure, of course, that it was at home and over time, but also in accessible ways. So things that already existed within the community that we could become a part of. So when we looked at this program and any success that came of it, what we were looking at is, are we offering change? And we were, we were offering something that was different. We were meeting someone halfway, but also how we were doing it. Someone wasn't sent, you know, a, a study design or sent, you know, this, would you like to be a part of this? It wasn't, it was an embedding within a community that happened. And we had success because of this. We had people come forward telling us about their traumas and how they felt comfortable because of oral traditions being respected and there was space for it. We had people who had come in for the first time in forever in some cases because they got to know us in the community, because they understood what we were all about. And then we learned even more. We could learn more about the colposcopy fears. We could learn about vaccine fears surrounding Indian hospitals in particular and what that looked like. And we could just completely engage in these conversations. And that engagement was absolutely the cornerstone of any of the work that we've done. Self screening swab right up to the work that we did in other cancers. Everything has landed on the same situation where we needed to embed ourselves within a community. And we always have this burden of time in medicine saying, you know what, I have deadlines, I have time shortages, I have this, but I will be really honest. This piece that is more beneficial to our team than it was to anyone else because we learned so much and had so much love surrounding us, that was the time. The actual swab collection or other pieces that we've done in community, that went quite quickly, to be honest, be other than COVID derailing us at times, but it was not that part. So when you look at the overall time commitment, where should we spend our time? It should be in the lead up of whatever someone wants to do. It should be very heavily weighted at the beginning to get to know these pieces and implement these pieces because then things actually are faster and easier to be really honest often. So we looked at things in this approach that was a very humble approach where we came in saying, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what this is gonna look like. We already have some idea of, of what's needed and desired, but we need to make sure that we are respecting and providing a relevant concept to families. And the relevance was a big piece because then folks said, oh, this actually could change how things happen in my community. This could actually be something that alters my daughter's future, my future, whomever. And again, it wasn't just based on that. It was that they had our attention, that our attention was being provided and our time was being provided to say, teach me about you. And I have also have some things that I could help with. 
So it was a little bit different. 